Good morning, good evening, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for the uh, today's Focus Bytes webinar. My name is Daria and I'm the Global Learning Program Manager with Focus Certification Academy and I will be your webinar host today. The webinar is now beginning, so all lines have been muted. Please use Q&A box for any questions or the chat box for comments you have throughout the webinar. The presentations will include PowerPoint, slides, and time for questions and answers. Today's topic is vascular applications for point-of-care ultrasound, and our speaker is Dr. Eugene Zierler. Dr. Zierler is a professor of surgery at the University of Washington Medical Center of the D.E. Strandons Jr. Vascular Laboratory at the University of Washington Medical Center and Harborview Medical Center in Seattle. Over the last 30 years, he has been involved in a series of projects based on the use of ultrasound duplex scanning for screening and follow-up of vascular problems, including carotid artery disease, lower extremity arterial disease, surveillance of vein bypass grafts, deep vein thrombosis, and renal artery disease. He has served on the board of directors of Intellios. He's also our education uh, committee chair and a past president of Intersocietal Commission for the Accreditation of Vascular Laboratories. Dr. Zeller is the author of over 100 journal articles and 50 books chapters, and he is the editor of six textbooks. Welcome, Dr. Zeller. We're so happy to have you today. Thank you so much for joining us. We're so excited to hear you speak. Okay, well, thank you very much for the nice introduction and, and uh, hello to everybody. Thank you for joining us. I'm going to start sharing my screen here um, and we'll get started. There we go. Um, so I thought I would uh, talk about the vascular applications for point of care ultrasound. Um, it, since this is the field that I've been involved in for, uh, really throughout my entire career. And uh, when we look at the development of ultrasound instrumentation from the uh, prototype duplex scanner that was developed back in the late 1970s up through uh, the, the small compact portable instruments, we see this progression. And, and this progression with lower cost, easier to use equipment really has enabled the, the POCUS or point of care ultrasound movement. Um, and this has involved a variety of applications as you all know. Uh, but basically, uh, we can use this for diagnosis, we can use it for screening, and we use it in some situations for uh, procedural guidance. But in, in any of these applications, the goal is to acquire additional clinical information that can be used immediately to facilitate an episode of patient care. And so I've just listed some of the more common uh, point of care ultrasound applications on this, uh, on this, this slide. And uh, the vascular applications are actually a relatively small, small component of all this, but these, these are the ones that we're going to be focusing on today. I'll talk a little bit about DVT screening, screening for abdominal aortic aneurysms, the evaluation of lower extremity arterial ischemia, vascular access, which in this case refers to needle access, and then the complications of, uh, complications of uh, vascular access, which are which are sometimes required diagnosis. So looking, looking back in terms of, of vascular uh, ultrasound, uh, the concept of point of care vascular ultrasound is really not new to those of us who train in vascular surgery because early on in our training, we're introduced to Doppler and things that we can do right at the bedside to, to facilitate patient care. And these are some old slides from, the, uh, from my mentor, Dr. Strandness, who uh, had a big hand in developing some of the, these techniques, but there was the, the old continuous wave Doppler venous exam, assessment of peripheral pulses, measurement of ankle pressures, and, and we'll, we'll talk about some of these that, that are still used. So I wanted to start off with a, with a polling question just to kind of assess the experience here. So uh, of, of, of those that are, that are uh, attending this webinar. So um, basically, which of the, uh, vascular POCUS applications have you personally performed? And in this case, you can check all the ones that apply. So have you done compression ultrasound for DVT? Have you evaluated lower extremity ischemia, screened for abdominal aortic aneurysms, uh, used ultrasound for vascular access or, or diagnosed complications after femoral access? We're 
about 50% people responded. So we'll open for a little bit more, maybe 10 more seconds to give a chance to respond. Yeah. I just want to try to get an idea of, of the sort of the uh, the level of experience with vascular applications because because you know, when I look at the scope of point of care ultrasound, uh, vascular is as I said is a relatively small component and I, it, it may not be all that prevalent. Here you go. Here are the results, Steve. Okay. Well, actually, that that that's more than I more than I expected, which is actually kind of nice. So, seventy five percent. It looks like I'm going to put my glasses here. Seventy percent, seventy five percent compression ultrasound, almost half for lower extremity ischemia. Fifty eight percent screening for abdominal aortic aneurysm. Forty two ultrasound guided access, and then the lowest percentage for complications. Okay. So this is a this is this is a fairly uh, interested vascular audience. So that's great. We'll, we'll go on. So when we look at the vascular point of care applications, most of them are either abbreviated or shortened or simplified versions of the complete diagnostic tests that are typically done in, in a dedicated vascular laboratory. But as I said, the goal in, in, in the setting is to answer a specific clinical question or guide a particular procedure at that particular uh, time in the patient's care. And uh, the point of care applications, the interpretation is generally very simple. It's, you know, it's either yes or no, present or absent, uh, high or low, something like that. So the first application I wanted to discuss was the two-zone compression ultrasound for proximal lower extremity DVT. And when we, when we think about lower extremity deep vein thrombosis, we tend to divide it up into proximal versus distal. And this refers to uh, the proximal or above knee DVT and distal or below knee or calf DVT. They all re refer to the same, same concept. But, but the main, the, the, the main uh, issue here is not the knee joint per se, but the popliteal vein. So popliteal vein and, and, and above is proximal. And then the calf veins, tibial veins, and muscular calf veins are uh, below knee or calf DVT. And, and the reason this is important is that if a patient does have a proximal DVT, they're at high risk for pulmonary embolism if they're not adequately treated. On the other hand, if it's, if it's confined to the calf veins, it's still clinically significant, but, uh, but major pulmonary embolism is, is much less common in that setting. So uh, the, the screening test that we're talking about here uh, applies to proximal DVT. And what this is, is a, uh, a, a two zone or two point compression for proximal DVT. And, and the, the, the more up to date um, name for this test is two zone because it's really two segments. It's not literally two points, but this, this refers to the common femoral vein and the popliteal vein. And uh, the screening test evaluates venous compressibility in these two segments. And the reason this works as well as it does in, in certain settings is that if a patient does have a proximal acute DVT, that one of these two segments is almost always involved. And this relies on B-mode imaging only, uh, color flow and Doppler are not required, and compressions are always performed in transverse view, and I'll give you some examples of this. So this, this uh, screening test is typically done with a patient in a supine position, the leg externally rotated, uh, beginning with the common femoral vein. This is imaged from the inguinal crease uh, proximally to the confluence of the deep femoral and femoral veins distally. Uh, and then the popliteal vein is imaged um, from, the, uh, from the distal thigh to the proximal calf over a, a segment that's 10 or 15 centimeters long. As I said, compressions are performed in a transverse view. This gives you a nice a circumferential view of, of the vein and the adjacent arteries and allows you to, to see the full compression is shown here in this sort of uncompressed and compressed view. Uh, the artery, of course, doesn't compress because it, it, uh, it does, doesn't require very much uh, pressure to compress the uh, low pressure vein. Um, and uh, I generally compress at about probe, probe width or one centimeter intervals. And then if you do four or five compressions over four or five centimeters that, that generally takes care of the, of the common femoral vein. Uh, the popliteal veins usually uh, best identified right at the level of the knee joint and then scanned and compressed proximally and distally from that point. 
As far as interpretation goes, as I mentioned, uh, this test is a B mode only, and there are basically two criteria. One is visualization of thrombus in the vein lumen, which uh, is often possible with, with good imaging systems. And the other is non-compressibility with direct probe pressure. And, and the reason that, that compression developed as a, as a technique or was started as a technique is that, that early on, uh, the B-mode imaging systems didn't really have very good resolution and some thrombus was uh, not very echogenic and, and it was impossible to tell um, just by the image whether there was thrombus in the lumen or whether it was flowing blood. So uh, if the uh, lumen could be compressed and the walls uh, come together, then that would indicate that there was nothing uh, preventing it from doing that and there nothing, uh, nothing solid in the lumen. Um, as I said, Doppler is not a part of the screening ultrasound exam. Just a couple of still images showing uh, echogenic thrombus. Uh, here's a transverse view of a common femoral vein. Here's a longitudinal view of a popliteal vein uh, with uh, fairly obvious uh, thrombus on B-mode imaging. As far as compression goes, these are just diagrams to show uh, normal compression and abnormal compression. Here's a normal artery and vein uh, with a probe compression, as you can see there. Uh, if there's material in the vein, uh, then it just won't compress, it, or it might, if it's uh, partially thrombosed, it may be partially compressible, or if it's completely thrombosed, it'll be non-compressible. A couple of video clips. Uh, here's a common femoral vein. You can see the vein right here compressing completely. Uh, these are actually the superficial femoral and deep femoral arteries. The common femoral arteries are already divided. Here's a popliteal artery down here and vein. With the, in this case, the popliteal vein being compressed completely, uh, coming in from posterior, the skin line is up here. And uh, examples rather of, of abnormal compressions. Um, this, this is a common femoral vein, and you can see uh, the common femoral vein partially compressing. And actually, when it's non compressed, you can't really see the thrombus, but when it's compressed, it looks a little more echogenic. And in this in this example of the popliteal vein, it doesn't compress at all. And that's that's pretty well completely thrombosed. This is just a summary of a systematic review of uh, this two zone or two point compression ultrasound performed in an emergency room setting. A uh, summary of about uh, six studies uh, and the pool results show a 95% sensitivity to 96% specificity. And so the, the experience does show that this particular test works well in the um, uh, sort of ambulatory care outpatient setting. Uh, it doesn't work as well in an inpatient setting where uh, calf DVT is, is probably more prevalent and occlusive femoral popliteal DVT may be less prevalent, but certainly in an outpatient ambulatory setting, it, it works very well. So as far as the two zone compression ultrasound test goes, in summary, uh, it's a screening test for proximal lower extremity DVT and it's sensitive and specific. And of course, proximal uh, DVT is, is important to identify and treat. Uh, the best results are obtained in symptomatic outpatients. It can be used for initial treat versus don't treat decisions. The limitations are primarily regarding uh, the failure to detect baloney or calf DVT or to detect uh, proximal inferior vena cava and iliac vein DVT. Uh, abnormal and non-diagnostic exams should be followed up with a complete diagnostic venous duplex and a normal exam can always be repeated if uh, the cl clinical suspicion for DVT remains and no other cause is found for the patient's symptoms. The next topic I wanted to address is suspected lower extremity ischemia. Uh, you know, healthcare providers are generally taught to palpate pulses during the physical exam, but and, and that's an important part of the exam, but, but pulse palpation is really not a very good method for identifying patients with critical limb ischemia. Uh, just simply the absence of pulses uh, uh, is not very helpful, although it is an abnormal finding. Uh, the Doppler pedal pulse assessment is based on audible uh, or uh, what you can hear with the flow signal. And uh, it's less subjective and more sensitive to low flow than pulse palpation. In other words, a Doppler can detect a pulse uh, 
uh, in an artery that you won't feel a pulse in. And remember that the frequency or pitch of the audible signal is directly proportional to blood flow velocity. So higher velocities or higher pitches uh, reflect faster flow. So as I said, this, uh, we, I'll show you some waveforms, uh, but, but for the, this uh, particular assessment, audible interpretation is, is all that's really required. Uh, you can use any um, uh, simple uh, continuous wave Doppler. This is, a, this is commonly found in the hospital or clinic setting. Uh, some of these fit, can fit, even fit in your pocket now. Um, the interpretation can be just pulses are present or absent. If you want to be a little more sophisticated and you have the experience, you can distinguish the normal multiphasic signal from an abnormal monophasic signal in an artery, and you can detect focal velocity increases that are uh, caused by stenosis. Um, and this gives you objective information on whether an artery is patent, whether it's normal or abnormal, and it can guide the selection of, of more sophisticated or formal tests. And I just included these diagrams here to, to remind, uh, remind you about Doppler angle, because the the uh, in addition to the, the velocity of the blood flow, the uh, pitch of the Doppler um, signal is related to Doppler angle. So if you use a 90 degree angle as shown in this particular cartoon and this, this diagram here, uh, the signal won't be as easy to hear and won't be uh, as diagnostic as a, a more acute angle. And if you can get an angle around 45 degrees like this, example that is probably the best way to go. Now, as far as interpreting Doppler signals go, the, 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 this is the way we represent uh, graphically a normal multiphasic, uh, in this case, triphasic arterial Doppler signal with a large systolic forward flow phase, uh, a short phase of flow reversal in, in late systole, early diastole, and then a final small forward phase in late diastole. Um, and, and if there's a stenosis uh, and you're listening distal to it, the stenosis really acts like a filter. And what it filters out is these um, rapidly changing components. And it also tends to lower and dampen down the systolic peak as shown there. So this creates a dampened uh, monophasic waveform. So it changes from a multiphasic to a monophasic flow pattern. And so these are representations of multiphasic flow, and it sounds like this. Hopefully you all can hear that. And then this is an example of monophasic flow, which sounds like this. So the multiphasic flow tends to have multiple components in each cardiac cycle. Well, the monophasic flow pattern seems to almost continue from one cycle to the other. So here's a, this is the second uh, question, which will pop up in a second, or there it is. So what does this arterial Doppler signal indicate? And I'll play it a couple of times here. So the options are a stenosis proximal to the posterior tibial artery, which is where we're listening there, normal flow in a posterior tibial artery, stenosis in the distal posterior tibial artery, or popliteal artery occlusion with collateral flow distally. Those are the options. So go ahead and, and this is, uh, I'll just select you the one answer to these. You're 50%, so I'll give another 10 seconds. Sure. All right. Here are the results for you. Okay, well, let's see. So 60, about two thirds said normal flow in a posterior tibial artery, and that, that's what I would say. So it's, it's really a normal sounding triphasic arterial Doppler signal. It doesn't really sound stenotic to me because it wouldn't be multiphasic. Um, 
and it doesn't really sound high pitched or or monophasic like a stenosis, um, and it, it doesn't sound like collateral flow. So um, two thirds got that one right. So here's another. This is question number three. So um, we'll play it first. So is this normal flow in a popliteal artery? This is a popliteal. We're listening in the popliteal fossa. Could it be pulsatile flow in a popliteal vein, popliteal artery stenosis, or popliteal artery occlusion distally? We are at 45%. Oh, okay. So I'll give it a little bit more time. Maybe this one, a little harder question. We are at 57%. So last five questions for you guys to answer. The results for you, Dr. Yeah, so 60% approximately popliteal artery stenosis. Uh, yeah, that, that's what I would have put. It's definitely monophasic, it's a little high, it has a little bit of a high pitch, particularly in the beginning. It's, it's certainly it's not normal because it's not multiphasic. Um, it's, I don't think it's pulsatile flow in a popliteal vein. Uh, it's, it, and uh, and it, it's not the kind of uh, signal that we would expect proximal to uh, um, an, uh, an arterial occlusion, which would be more of a staccato uh, thumping sound. So uh, popliteal artery stenosis is the correct answer, is, is the best answer here. And this is the last question. Um, one more uh, signal, and this is taken from a mid thigh. <laughs> Is this an arterial venous fistula? Is it a stricture in the femoral vein? A stenosis in the deep femoral artery or superficial femoral artery occlusion with collateral flow in the thigh? We are at 52%. So I'll give another 10 seconds. Right. Here are the okay. results. Huh. Well, I, I'm gonna show you the next, you can you leave, leave that pop up up there. Um, what this was, was actually an arterial venous fistula. Um, it, uh, it, it, it doesn't have that much pulsatility and there's, it, you know, it's very low resistance and it sort of goes from one cycle to the next. Um, it's probably it, the stricture in the femoral vein. It's a little bit, um, too pulsatile for that. Um, it could be a stenosis in a deep femoral artery branch. That's not a, that's not a bad answer. Um, it is high pitched. Um, uh, it's a little, it, it's a little bit too pulsatile perhaps for, for some collateral flow, but this, this, this one is, is harder. Um, and, uh, this, this is a CTA from, um, from, uh, this patient and you can see, uh, filling of the uh, vein from the artery there, right there. Um, so th this was a signal from an AV fistula, traumatic AV fistula in this case. And then before we finish with um, 
lower extremity ischemia. I just wanted to mention the ankle brachial index because this is something that that uh, we do in the vascular lab, but can can be done very easily at the bedside if you have a cuff and a Doppler. Um, this is measurement of the ankle pressure using the either the dorsalis pedis or posterior tibial artery, and uh, then uh, comparing it to the the highest of the uh, brachial systolic pressures, assuming the brachial systolic pressure uh, represents their systemic pressure. The ankle brachial index is, is very sensitive and specific for the detection of, of uh, arterial stenosis and occlusion or peripheral arterial disease. Um, these are the current criteria for classification of the ABI. The, the uh, normal range is 1.00 to 1.40. Uh, if it's less than that, if that particularly less than 0 0.90, that's abnormal. There's this borderline category, uh, which is close to the normal range. And if it's if it's above the normal range, that reflects non-compressible or calcified vessel. Let's talk about screening for abdominal aortic aneurysms. This is a, another application uh, that can be done as a point of care ultrasound examination. So there are a number of randomized uh, clinical trials on screening for abdominal aortic aneurysms, and, and they've shown uh, a benefit in terms of uh, reducing, reducing the incidence of rupture and decreasing uh, aneurysm-related deaths. And so technical guidelines have been published for this examination by a number of uh, societies and groups. And uh, in the US, uh, the exam is even covered by, by Medicare, um, and it's been recommended by by, as I said, by a number of groups, including the Society for Vascular Surgery and the US Preventive Services Task Force. And uh, this is taken from the, uh, the most recent version of the US Preventive Services Task Force recommendations. Uh, they start out by, by emphasizing that ultrasound is accurate uh, for AAA screening. And it recommends one-time screening for abdominal aortic aneurysm in men aged 65 to 75 who have ever smoked and uh, recommend selectively offering screening uh, in men in that age group who have never smoked. Uh, they don't go so far as to recommend uh, screening in women um, uh, uh, at this time anyway, although there's some group, there's some other guidelines that do recommend screening in women. And the, the, re the reason for the, the way this is done is that the risk of rupture of an abdominal aortic aneurysm is, is basically related to the uh, size uh, or in this case, what we measure is the diameter is shown in that uh, CT scan. And the, the size or diameter at which the rate of rupture starts to increase dramatically is around five to five and a half centimeters. So most, most guidelines for treatment um, uh, recommend treatment starting around that range. Uh, of course, some abdominal aortic aneurysms can be palpable on physical exam, especially when they're large and the patient is thin. But in general, the physical exam is not very sensitive and it's often limited by uh, patient body habitus. Um, but as, as we know, these aneurysms are easily imaged with ultrasound. Um, and this can be done as a screening test. It can be done to confirm a physical exam finding or suspicion. Uh, once an aneurysm has been identified, if it's small and, and not uh, above the threshold for treatment, it can be followed. Um, because aneurysms, once they're detected, they never go away. They may, may or may not enlarge over time, but many of them do. Um, and of course, ultrasound can be used for surveillance after aneurysm repair, which is a totally different topic. So really what, we're, what we really need to know is the maximum aortic diameter. Uh, this is measured outer wall to outer wall. The AP measurement is more reliable than the transverse. I'll show you an, Im uh, an image of that in, in a minute. Uh, the normal inferior aorta is typically less than or equal to about 2.0 cm in diameter. If the aorta measurement, diameter measurement is two to three centimeters, that's considered ectatic or dilated. And if it's 3.0, if it's greater than 3.0 centimeters, it's considered uh, aneurysmal. And as I said, the threshold for intervention is in the 5.0 to 5.5 centimeter range. And uh, experience has shown that the variability for aortic ultrasound measurements is about five millimeters. So if two measurements are within plus or minus five millimeters of each other, the difference is probably not uh, clinically significant. So here, here's a nice uh, clear image of a, trans a transverse image of a uh, abdominal aortic aneurysm. Um, 
And uh, there's the AP measurement, which in this case is uh, uh, 5.0 centimeters. And because of ultrasound physics, we know that the interface between the anterior and posterior, uh, or the inter interface between the walls and the AP uh, direction is much clearer than it is in the transverse direction. Uh, even though we often take a transverse measurement and you can pretty much guess where it is. You don't see the walls as well. This is a sagittal view with an AP measurement. Uh, the transverse view is better because in a sagittal view, of course, you don't know if you're at the maximum diameter. Here's an interesting study that was done on a VA vascular surgical service uh, in which uh, the uh, vascular surgery staff were trained to do a, a uh, uh, an ultrasound screening exam for abnormal aortic aneurysm with a handheld ultrasound device, and it was compared to a conventional ultrasound done uh, by, by sonographers in a vascular laboratory. Uh, the average time for the exam was 5.3 minutes for the handheld device by the vascular surgeons versus 3.1 minutes for the RVTs. So obviously the RVTs are, are faster and they probably had more sophisticated equipment. That's not a big surprise, but, but, uh, but uh, the exam could be done. Sensitivity and specificity of the handheld ultrasound for detecting aneurysms were 93% and 97% uh, respectively. Um, so the, uh, the quick handheld screening uh, uh, done as a point of care exam uh, was uh, compared very well to the standard um, diagnostic exam. So the overall diagnostic accuracy was 98%. And these are the, um, the uh, standards from IAC vascular testing for abdominal aortic aneurysm screening. Uh, the normal exam just requires one image, one transverse image with the widest outer wall to outer wall diameter. And the um, abnormal examination requires two images, uh, one showing the largest diameter and one showing a non-dilated segment for comparison. And I wanted to talk about um, ultrasound guided vascular access. So uh, first we'll, we'll address the issue of ultrasound guided central venous access, because this is a very common uh, application for ultrasound guidance. Uh, the use of ultrasound guided central venous access is supported by a number of uh, societies. It's been shown to um, result in lower failure rates, complications, and, and the need for fewer attempts to get a line in. It has the greatest benefit uh, with internal jugular lines, but um, it also can be helpful for subclavian lines and, and femoral art artery and vein access. When we talk about ultrasound guidance, we can divide it into either static guidance or dynamic guidance. Static guidance refers to the practice of identifying the target vessel with ultrasound, marking it on the skin, putting the probe down, and then um, puncturing uh, from that point on without the use of ultrasound during, during the actual insertion of the needle. Dynamic guidance is um, the use of ultrasound throughout the, um, the access procedure and actually visualizing the needle as it, um, as it uh, goes toward the target vessel and, and, is, and cannulates the vessel. Um, Static guidance is easier. It requires less skill. Um, dynamic guidance is, is, more, is for more sophisticated or experienced users. When we use ultrasound for um, needle access guidance, we, use, we can either use a long axis or in-plane view or a transverse or outer plane view. Uh, and these are just some, some diagrams which show the, the, uh, the longitudinal and the transverse approaches. Um, the, um, the, these, these two approaches have their advantages and disadvantages. I'll show you some more images in a second. This actually is, is a uh, simulator that, that we use for, for central venous access training, which is scannable. Um, and you can see here um, uh, someone practicing, in this case, uh, a transverse view um, and puncturing. And, and these are images from the simulator, which show what a transverse and, a, and longitudinal images look like. So in a transverse image, you can see circumferential um, images of the target vessels. In this case, this would be a simulated vein, this is an artery. Um, the, and the, the, the issue with transverse uh, imaging in this setting 
is that you can see the needle, but it's harder to know where the needle tip is. So in these images, here's the needle in cross section. Here's the needle actually inside the target vessel, but you don't know where the needle tip is. Uh, here's a longitudinal view. Uh, and in this case, you can see the needle tip here going toward the vessel, and in this case, penetrating the vessel. Uh, the longitudinal imaging uh, requires a little more practice and a little more skill because the trick here, of course, is to keep the very small needle uh, within the very thin image plane, and that it does take some practice. This is a study that looked at the use of ultrasound guidance and compared dynamic uh, guidance, static guidance, and just landmark guidance. And landmark guidance would just be with, uh, with no ultrasound at all, just uh, based on, on, on the um, examiner's knowledge of anatomy. But if you look at the uh, results in terms of cannulation success and first attempt success, both dynamic and static guidance uh, were better than landmark guidance. And as you might expect, dynamic guidance is better than static guidance. Um, but it, it, as, as a general sort of standard of practice now, central venous cannula placement should be conducted uh, with some sort of ultrasound guidance, uh, either static or dynamic. And I think most, most of us now would, would, would be in favor of dynamic guidance. Uh, just to, to mention femoral artery access, because femoral artery access is an extremely common um, uh, procedure uh, since the femoral artery is, is the, um, the access site for almost any um, interventional procedure on the abdominal aorta, uh, many cardiac procedures, uh, and lower extremity arterial procedures. And th this is a study that looked at 88 patients who had percutaneous closure uh, of 152 femoral artery access sites, in this case for um, endovascular aortic aneurysm repair. So these patients require bilateral femoral artery access. Um, and uh, landmark guided access was used in 93 sites and ultrasonic guided access in 59 sites. Not, not a randomized study, but just comparing these two um, approaches. Access related complications were significantly reduced in the group undergoing ultrasound guided access in fact, they, they, they were reduced down to 0% versus 7% uh, in the large landmark access group. Mean operative time was decreased from 154 to 101 minutes after the addition of ultrasound guidance for access. And um, the addition of ultrasound guided femoral access to totally percutaneous aortic aneurysm repair increased technical success rates for vessel closure and decreased access related complications. And it was particularly uh, uh, important that uh, it appeared to have the, uh, the largest impact or the best benefit on patients with larger sheet sizes since larger sheet sizes are, are more likely to cause complications. And then just kind of in the last few minutes, uh, I wanted to talk about screening for complications after femoral access because femoral access is extremely common and, and uh, it goes well in the majority of cases, but in some cases, uh, complications can occur and it's important to recognize and treat them. Um, so when we look at the groin vessels and we're talking here about common femoral artery and common femoral vein and their branches, uh, it requires the same basic scanning skills that we talked about earlier for the two zone compression ultrasound venous examination. Um, although with the addition of pulse Doppler and color flow Doppler, so it does turn into a little bit more of a sophisticated examination. Uh, but the, 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 the complications that we may be looking for are pseudoaneurysms, deep vein thrombosis, AV fistulas, hematomas, arterial stenosis and occlusions, and, and other vascular injuries, of course, are possible, like uh, dissections and so on. But here are just some images from a case with an arterial venous fistula, um, and, and this generally occurs between the common femoral artery and an adjacent vein, like the common femoral vein uh, or the deep femoral vein. Um, this kind of this is the kind of signal that would be expected from a fistula site, and uh, it would sound a lot like the AV fistula uh, audio clip that I showed you from the traumatic AV fistula earlier. Um, the common femoral artery signal would be altered with a lower resistance, since it is perfusing the the fistula as well as the lower extremity, and then the common femoral vein would be somewhat pulsatile because of the presence of the fistula. 
So putting that together, uh, one can uh, make a diagnosis of a fistula and actually localize the problem. Uh, venous ablation, sap, great saphenous vein ablation is a fairly common procedure now. Um, and uh, one of the uh, fairly uncommon complications of um, a venous ablation is extension of thrombus from the ablated great saphenous vein into the common femoral vein, uh, it, which, which can cause a deep, deep vein thrombosis. Um, here's an example of a, of a little bit of a protrusion of thrombus into the common femoral vein, uh, a longitudinal view and a transverse view. Um, and uh, when a patient comes back for a follow-up after a venous ablation procedure, uh, this can be done as a point of care examination in the clinic uh, and uh, to confirm uh, the status of the common femoral vein. And probably the most, one of the most common uh, complications of femoral artery access when complications occur is, is a, uh, a pseudoaneurysm. Uh, here's an example of a fairly typical pseudoaneurysm with the common femoral artery down here, uh, the connecting neck or tract and then the flow cavity here, fairly close to the skin line. Um, and these are um, uh, detected by B mode and color flow imaging. Pulse Doppler helps to confirm uh, the presence of flow. This, this is a to and fro flow pattern, which is typical of a pseudoaneurysm neck. And uh, once this is, this is diagnosed, then the ultrasound can also be used for for uh, guiding treatment. This is an ultrasound guided thrombin injection. Here's, you can see the needle in the cavity and then the thrombosed cavity um, after the thrombin injection and removal of the needle. So that brings me to the, to the end of, of this talk on point of care ultrasound vascular applications. We talked about compression ultrasound for lower extremity DVT, uh, specifically screening for proximal deep vein thrombosis. We talked about the uh, evaluation for suspected lower extremity arterial ischemia with the assessment of arterial pulses in the ankle brachial index. We talked about screening for abdominal aortic aneurysms and measurement of aortic diameter, particularly looking for aortic diameters of three of greater than 3.0 centimeters. We talked about ultrasound guided vascular access, uh, central veins, femoral artery access, uh, we didn't talk about some of the other applications like radial artery cannulation or, or peripheral venous cannulation, but that those are also um, uh, good, good applications of, of ultrasound uh, for access. And then finally, we just finished up mentioning some of the uh, ways we can look for complications after femoral uh, artery and vein access. So that's all I've got. Um, so we can finish up and see if there are any questions or or discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Ziegler. We have a couple of questions, so I'll go ahead and get started. The first question, um, do, we need, uh, do we know how much learning and training is needed to reach high accuracy with DVT assessment? Um, so as, as far as how much training do you need, um, I guess, I guess, uh, I'll answer that by, by the, the, the uh, quoting some of the papers that have been published on that or referring to them. Uh, there are at least a couple of papers which, which have looked at the results of, of individuals who have had just a relatively short training program, like a, a tutorial in a vascular lab for an hour or so. And, and uh, typically they can go out and start doing the exam and get very good results for it. I mean, I think uh, the more you do it, the better you get at it, but uh, it doesn't take a lot of training to to be able to get started with it. Thank you. And in addition to it, like always consider certification. Is that what we, what we offer? Like after you get your training, that's another layer of patient safety that um, you can add to. So, sure. Yeah. I mean, there, there is, there is a, a DVT module for the two point compression exam uh, in the point of care Academy. So. Definitely. Uh, that certainly is a way of documenting expertise. Perfect. The next question, could the Doppler sound only indicate stenosis when using the pencil Doppler at the bedside? Um, well, it's, you can certainly, um, you know, once you learn how to uh, uh, recognize the different sounds, you can, you can differentiate a normal artery from a stenotic artery. 
Um, the other, the other, of course, is that if you can't find the signal at all, and you're sure the Doppler is working properly, and you're sure you're in the right place, then the artery could be completely occluded as well. Um, if you're in a situation where you can go proximal and distal to the site, then you can certainly um, keep going proximally until you find an artery that is patent. But I would say you, you, you should think in terms of a normal artery, a stenotic artery, and an occluded artery. Thank you so much. Another question, is there a CPT code for reimbursement for the two zone compression ultrasound for DVT? Um, you know, I'm not an expert in CPT codes in billing and also I'll admit that up front. I, I'm not aware that there's a CPT code for it specifically. Um, uh, as when it's billing for the exam, uh, for point of care exams is, is sort of a topic that maybe uh, deserves its own webinar, but um, um, I think it can be billed as a limited uh, venous ultrasound exam, uh, since you're not doing the complete whole leg study or a bilateral study. Um, I mean, even, even if you do both sides, you're not doing the whole leg, so it, it cannot be considered a complete study, but it could be considered a limited study. There are other requirements for billing besides just a CBT code, for example, a report and, and a saving of images. Um, so those are, there are other requirements for billing besides just a CPT code that you should be aware of. Perfect. Thank you. Um, another question is when do you repeat scans, especially for DVT? Um, well, I think there, if, if the scan is abnormal and you see a DVT, you don't necessarily need to repeat it for diagnostic purposes. Um, in, in our, in our institution, we still recommend that, that the patient have a, uh, a diagnostic study in the vascular lab to document the, the full extent of the deep vein thrombosis. Um, on the other hand, if, if, if a patient has a negative or normal two-zone compression exam uh, and their symptoms persist and no other, um, no other cause is found for their symptoms, then I think you can either repeat the exam uh, or you can, of course, refer them for a, for a diagnostic study in a vascular laboratory. Um, but uh, uh, re repeating a normal study once uh, is certainly a reasonable, um, if no other cause is found for the patient's symptoms and the patient's symptomatic. Thank you. Um, uh, another question is, is there a role for D-dimer level in DVT? Oh yeah, that yeah. I didn't mention D, D, D dimer, but that's that's a good question. Um, and then the short answer is yes, there is a role for it. Um, not not all groups seem to to use it, uh, but um, but for example, uh, in the out again in the outpatient setting, if a patient has a negative D dimer and a negative two zone compression, there's evidence to suggest that no further testing really needs to be done because the chances of that patient uh, having a DVT in that setting are extremely low. Uh, that is with a negative D-dimer and a negative two-zone compression. Um, uh, uh, unfortunately, there are, are um, lots of things that cause, cause false positive D-dimers. Um, so, um, you know, a positive D-dimer and a negative um, uh, two-zone compression is, is not quite as helpful, but um, um, but a negative D-dimer can be, can be helpful. Thank you. One more question for monitoring purposes for DVT. How often do you use ultrasound? For monitoring purposes? Well, I'm not, I, I guess what you, depends on what you mean by monitoring. We don't really monitor DVT. We, we diagnose DVT. And then, um, you know, if, if a patient has a DVT, we, we, uh, Decide how, how best to treat it, or or if it's a if it's a nice if it's an isolated cap DVT, some clinicians would would not um, would not treat that. So I guess the, the the one setting in which you might use it for monitoring is in an isolated cap DVT that's not being treated. Um, in which case, you would repeat it at about, about five to seven days to see if if it's extended um, outside the calf. Um, and of course, if it extends, then it becomes a proximal DVT and, and it really should be treated unless there's a contraindication. Um, but I don't think there's a role for ultrasound in monitoring DVT 
during treatment, you know, unless the patient develops some new symptoms or something else like that. Got it. Uh, there's a couple of more questions back to D-dimer. Uh, so first one, if, if D-dimer positive, but scan is negative, then what are the next steps? Well, as I said, false positive D-dimers occur. So um, you, you really don't, you really can't, um, you really don't know what's going on with that patient. What I, what I would do with that patient is, is um, uh, try to get a, a whole leg duplex in a vascular lab setting. So, um, so you can look at the calf veins, look at the IBC iliac veins um, and, and see if there's a, um, you know, a, a thrombus that's being missed by the two zone compression exam. Um, uh, and you, of course you can continue to look for other diagnoses that would cause the patient symptoms as well. But I think you're obliged to, to, um, uh, go a little bit further to rule out a DVT that might've been missed by the screening exam. Okay. And, um, uh, um, do you scan the other leg if one turns to have DVT? That, 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 that's an interesting question. Uh, it, the, in our lab, the answer is yes. If, uh, it, it, and it, I'm, I'm talking about the, um, the, uh, the diagnostic exam that we do, that the sonographer does in our vascular lab, our, our, our policy generally is that if a patient uh, has a symptomatic leg, then the symptomatic leg is scanned first. Um, and if, if the symptomatic leg uh, has a DVT, we scan the opposite leg. Um, not all labs do that, but, um, but we tend to do that uh, because there's, there's a, uh, uh, a fairly high prevalence. It's, 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 it's not the majority, it's a minority, but it, there's still a, a, pre a significant prevalence of asymptomatic contralateral DVT um, in, in, in a patient who has a symptomatic leg. Uh, on the other hand, if, if a patient has a symptomatic leg and we scan the symptomatic leg and it's negative for DVT, in other words, there's no DVT in the symptomatic leg at all, then we don't scan the other leg, although we, we always scan the contralateral common femoral vein because that's part of the protocol. Okay. Um, how do you differentiate chronic, subacute, and acute DVT based on POCUS findings? Thank you. Uh, yeah, well, that, that again, that that that's a, can be a long discussion. But um, as far as trying to determine the age of a thrombus uh, by ultrasound, um, and and the same principles would apply for point of care and, and diagnostic, because uh, it's it's generally a, a B mode image kind of um, kind of uh, diagnosis. Um, there's really no way to, to uh, determine the age of a thrombus in terms of days uh, accurately. Um, but there are some features that, that are clearly uh, associated with an acute deep vein thrombosis. And those are such things as a, uh, a, a dilated vein, um, a deformable thrombus, that is it partially compresses. Um, it's usually hypoechoic, although it's not always hypoechoic. Um, and, and so those are some of the features that, that suggest an acute DVT. On the other extreme, there are features that go along with, with a more chronic process. And the term we use is chronic post-thrombotic changes. Um, and that would be a, a, a small contracted vein, a hyperechoic um, uh, thickened wall um, and uh, uh, collateral veins. Uh, venous reflux is often associated with more chronic changes. Um, I, I don't recommend the use of the term subacute because it doesn't really have any, any well-defined meaning. Um, acute is usually days to maybe weeks. Um, chronic is more months to years. Um, uh, sometimes subacute is somewhere in between. But the, the, the term I like, I like is age indeterminate. When, when it doesn't look clearly acute and it doesn't look clearly chronic, then uh, the term we use is age indeterminate. Um, but, but, but I try to avoid the term subacute. Thank you so much. Uh, one more question is, um, is about equipment. And I saw a couple of people also put it in the chat. 
Uh, what kind of equipment do you recommend having in the office? Uh, vascular Doppler, or Doppler ultrasound machine? And um, is there a way you can recommend where people can buy machines that are affordable? Um, so these are uh, questions about the equipment. Why? Um, well, in, 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 term, in, in general terms, I mean, it, it obviously depends on your practice setting. I mean, I think that at least you should have a, uh, a basic continuous wave Doppler so you can listen to Doppler signals and, and, measure, and, a, and a set of cuffs to do ankle pressures. Um, so you can do an ankle brachial index. Um, if, uh, if you want to do more sophisticated tests like the two zone compression or um, tri AAA screening, then you need something with, with, uh, that has a, a, a good B mode image. Uh, and most of them, even the small machines now have at least color flow and many of them have pulse Doppler as well. Um, you know, I don't, I find it difficult to re recommend any specific brand of equipment because it really depends on um, so what's available in your area you know, and uh, you know, what your budget is and so on. But there are a lot of companies that, uh, that, or there are multiple companies, I should say, that, that make equipment that, that is very suitable for the exams that we talked about today. Um, and uh, uh, they, they range from, uh, you know, full-featured uh, machines that are, that are freestanding to laptop-based kind of machines and even pocket uh, uh, equipment. Um, but it all sort of depends on, on uh, which exams you want to do, how you want to store your images, um, or whether you want to store images at all, um, and so on. So I, uh, I guess my recommendation would be to, to, to try to find out what companies have representatives in your area, and, and uh, most of the companies are, are more than happy to come in and show you what they've got and what might be suitable for what you what you want to do. Yeah, in addition to this, we have some resources on our website that you can check it out uh, under community tab. So and uh, contact us for additional questions. Um, we also had a question about training, where people can get training. And I just wanna add uh, that we have a program that is called Pokusha Education Provider Network Program, uh, where we connect uh, individuals, or if you need to train a group with our um, uh, education providers, uh, we have about 17 of them at this moment and we can find the best fit. So if you would like to contact us for training, just feel free to email us and, and we'll help you out as well. But uh, we are at times. Um, again, uh, thank you so much, Dr. Zeeler. This was excellent. The chat and questions were on fire, <laughs> very busy. <laughs> so this is great engagement. Thank you guys so much for joining us today. Before you leave, there is a poll question. So we just want to um, ask you, will, be, will you be, uh, be able to apply what you learned today? Um, so if you can take some time, this helps us to plan next webinars. Um, and then I also wanted to mention that we hope to see you at our Focus World Conference that will be happening in September. Uh, we will have many sessions like this uh, at the conference. And then if you're would like to present, uh, we still have our call for abstracts open until the 15th. So uh, feel free to submit your session proposal as well if you would like to share anything with the community. And again, thank you everyone, Dr. Zeeler, we really appreciate you. Uh, this was recorded by the way, so you will receive the link with the recording um, uh, within a week. So thank you so much. Okay, thank you everybody. Have a good one.